Well, good morning to all, and thank you for that lovely introduction. I, I think of myself less as hybrid than as liminal <laughs> most of my career. I've always been kind of in between a lot of different things, which I'm comfortable in, but doesn't always make it easy to explain to people what I do. Um, um, it's always a bit of a problem coming first, um, right at the beginning of a conference, because um, ex you're expected to set the tone, in a way, for the forthcoming performances without knowing what instruments are going to be played. Um, so I will present my own composition and hope it's not too dissonant with the others. Um, I was going to approach this problem, um, the problem of digitality and representation in a way, from the point of view of the genealogy of representation in anthropological museums. However, the more I wrote this paper, um, the, uh, the more distant digitality became. I hope I don't get into trouble for saying this, but it's interesting, I work in lots of different digital spaces and digital you know, settings, and one of the few places I find very little digitality, except in trivial senses, in the museum. And I've worked there for over 35 years. Um, so I wrote this paper more, I decided I'd write this paper slightly differently, in fact, and better to approach the problem from the side of digitality itself um, rather than the museum. Um, we'll get to museum representation in, in several points, and I hope that you don't mind me deviating quite so much from my abstract, although the general principle remains. Um, I would like to start by quoting Simon Cantwell Smith um, from the first, his first paragraph of his entry for the catalog of the exhibition Noise, Universal Language, Pattern Recognition, and Data Synesthetics, which was held in Cambridge, UK, not not in Massachusetts, in 2000. Uh, here Cantwell Smith neatly summarizes the problem I would like to address today, both asking the question, what is digitality, but mostly, why do we think it is something epistemologically pure? As he says, it seems as if Plato's heaven is being replaced by the eternal perfection of an abstract realm of zeros and ones. My goal is that we will wind up with an understanding of digitality, and I touch on databases as well, that is far messier and noisier than we started with. So I, I wish to approach these questions nonetheless genealogically um, through a couple of brief provocative histories. But first I want to attack one of the more fundamental misunderstandings about digitality itself that is repeated here by Cantwell Smith um, that is, digitality is about zeros and ones. Um, for those of you who get this very, very geeky joke, um, we could reword it by saying that practically no one understands what digitality is. One thing that digitality certainly is not is zeros and ones. The most almost universal representation of digital code um, as zeros and ones, is in fact a mere metaphor. Ones and zeros are stored digitally, but as codes, not as ones and zeros. Something much messier and more interesting is being created when we create digital signals. To find some clarity here, we need to go back, way back. This is the very first digital media the first instrument that was fully digital. It is not a computer. It does not calculate. It is an information storage and transfer device. It is a telegraph. This is the telegraph of Jean-Maurice Emile Bardot, a French telegraph operator who invented this device to overcome the problems of transmitting telegraphs via Morse's code. The tele this telegraph overcame many of the problems by simply transmitting letters, not as complex interpreted five-level code, which Morse's code is, it's not digital, um, but uh, by using a much simpler code, digital, ons and offs. Using a five-bit encoding, Baudot's telegraph offered accurate message transmission multiplexed by 1874. 
Now, Badeau's telegraph would be simply a mere his, a bit of historical trivia if it were not for the fact that his digital encoding not only became the exclusive form of message transmission by the beginning of the 20th century, yes, all telegraph transmissions were digital by 1906, but also because his five-bit encoding of the capital Latin letters is the same encoding that our computers use today. Key here, however, is his paper tape, which does not encode by ones and zeros, but by holes and not holes. The not holes, the absence of a hole, are as important as the holes. Passing through the electronic reader, this produced an encoding of synchronous ons and offs. It is, the, it is the encoding of synchronous ons and offs that characterize the digital, not binary numbers. This is the pattern of the digital. It is not binary. It is not numbers. It is not mathematical. It is merely the simplest of presences and absences, a synchronous series of something there or something not there, electronically on, off, off, on. This simplicity is critical to understanding the digital, I would argue. The simplicity of digital encoding is not only foundational to its entire genealogy, but it is also critical to understand the medium that we work with today. Because the digital is not numbers, it is not ontologically numeric. It is not ontologically mathematical. It is not ontologically computational. Right? Computers are not called computers because they compute. But that's a different story. What digital encoding necessitates is transfiguration. Processing. Processes must exist for digital encoding to be anything. And what these processes can produce are limited only by our expressive desires. Digitality is an expressive media, not a computational ontology. I'll keep here. Yeah. <clears throat> to make my case of the genealogy of this technology being a history of expressive desire, we don't have to go back as far as the 19th century, but we can go back to the callow age of electronic computers. Here we have the first fully digital computer. Well, actually you don't, because it's off the screen, because it was the size of a small, medium-sized house. Um, however, what we do have in this image is the very first computer interactive device, the light pen, and the first computer graphic. This is the very first computer graphic. The MIT made up of dots there. <clears throat> this now familiar use of an electronic computer as an expressive medium through text, image, graphics, and sound did not simply arise from the creation of the first fully digital computer, the whirlwind computer <clears throat> of MIT's Lincoln Lab, but from its genesis, from its creation. It was immediately recognized and essentialized almost in the production of the computer itself that the utility of digital encoding processed via Claude Shannon's logic relays was to transform what was intended to be a fast computer into an expressive media. After only eight years, and on the successor to the whirlwind, the TX2, Ivan Sutherland here, um, a student of Claude Shannon's, had built the very first object-oriented interactive graphic system, Sketchpad. Now, the dates we're talking about for the, very, the first computer graphic is 1949, and Claude Shannon, uh, not Claude Shannon, excuse me, um, Ivan Sutherland here, uh, who's still alive, um, built Sketchpad in 1958. Even the very first use of digital computers by the US military, which most of them were built for at that time, 
um, SAGE in the mid-1950s was an interactive graphical system that transformed vast quantities of distributed data into mediated expressions. Versimilitude was never the goal, even in the 1950s. And by 1960, computers were almost wholly dedicated to expressive mediation of information and data. Let's see, I have to play a little video here, if I can get it to play, let's hope. There we go. We must remember that the fully developed digital media environment that we are familiar with today on all of our devices was largely imagined by 1964. And working to some, in some form by 1974. The interactive digital media that we think of today as a development of the internet, and I'm gonna start this over because there's someone who comes on I don't want you to see just yet. <laughs> there, we'll play it again. Anyway, um, so the, today as a development of the internet was imagined and assembled in the mid 1970s. Here we see a demonstration of the Xerox Alto computer with a mouse and keyboard, bitmap graphics, local area networks, folders, files, menus, editable text, digital video, and a host of other features that are familiar to us today. This, this particular demo, although this system was working by 1975, was given in 1979 by the team at Xerox Park to a team from a new and upcoming company in the area led by a very young Steve Jobs. It is here where Steve Jobs encountered digital media's expressive media, that's not Steve Jobs, um, and went off to develop the Macintosh. This was, the, was what inspired them to create Macintosh. There he is, there's Steve Jobs. Now we're going to leave that genealogy because in a way that brings us into the kind of mediation of the digital that we're familiar with, although it has undergone changes. And I want to look at a different genealogy, that of the database, which is also central. It's, it's a fundamental, we could even say fetishized, schema in museums. It remains the most cherished of our technological mediations, of our collected objects. Yet we also understand very little about it. This is the usual engagement we have with a database, at least online, at least with collections. It is so pervasive that we assume that this is the stable and predestined schema. However, like digitality, so much of databasing is more fantasy than fact. First, what we see here is not a database. Okay, it's not a database. That is not a database. The data used is stored in a database, in this case, the, the Merlin database of the British Museum, and the two are linked, but not deterministically so. We, or someone, decided to describe these objects with this data. And we, or someone, decided to configure this data in a catalog format. This was not necessary, but was a choice, a desire manifest. And behind these manifestations, other desires are manifest. It's another aspect of the digital. There are desires upon desires upon desires manifest. Stories upon stories upon stories. Desires that look something like this. This is a database, not the Merlin database, because you'd be surprised how protecti protective museums are of their databases. Um, they're happy to show you the catalog manifestations, but not the structures hidden behind. This is a trivial database, if any database is trivial, um, for our exemplification. What we see is a structure. This may be familiar to some, but even if not familiar, it is indicative of what we usually think of as databases. However, we should unpack it a little bit. The database is not one entity, unified, but an assemblage of entities. Comprising the database are a number of tables, first of all. Each table should, according to database theory, um, relate to a coherent entity, not an object, but to a coherent aspect of the object which will be recorded in the table. 
For museums, a table may be about an accessioning event, it may refer to the exhibition history of objects, or the conservation here, uh, history. Certainly there should be a table about the description of the object itself. Tables are comprised of records, which we see down here. Right? Each which does refer to an object or an event. These records are comprised of fields or discrete bits of data, still coherent and predefined, that consistently describe the object or event within the context of the table. Now that's pretty simple, isn't it? Well, not really. As it can get extremely complicated. Not only are databases hierarchical assemblages, as I've just described, but they are also relational networks. The whole point, the epistemological necessity of a relational database is that it breaks the database referent up into discrete bits that both wind up representing the entirety of the, of the referent, but do so by not overlapping. Each table is then related to other tables by shared keys comprising a model or ontology of the referent, for example, the operations of a museum. So this is what databases are then. Well, not really. What I've just described so very basically is not what databases are, but only what a very particular type of database is, a relational database. The relational database was devised by Edward F. Codd, an IBM engineer in the 1970s. Then, when he first developed it for IBM, no one thought it was a very good idea, as there were other perfectly pr good and proven database models about already in use. Only with the rise of personal computers and the need for generalized database systems did RDBMS, Relational Database Management Systems, gained prominence, basically in the end of the 1980s. Throughout the 1990s, relational databases became so prominent that even the definitive manga guide to databases, it does exist, <laughs> deals only with relational databases. They mention no other type of database. However, despite the seeming dominion of relational databases backed by the authority of manga, um, this was never the case, and it certainly is not the case today. Let's think of a different way of storing data, a much older way. When we create our documents, like the one I'm reading, we are not creating a single document, not when they're digital, typed as we see it on the screen, but an assemblage of documents. There is a small, this is a small bit of my Word document of notes for a class, for instance. Not only is my document made up of no less than 20 different files, but the content of the files are heavily structured. This is true for all digital files today. They contain vast quantities of information marked and structured in the documents themselves. What if we instead of classifying and recording our descriptions of these documents, creating an ontology in the database, we just store the documents themselves with a schema of how they are marked up and structured. What we could then do is to have a system that allows us to query directly the structured content of the document itself, even as it changes, even as our questions change. We can ask a diversity of questions of the document because we're just engaging directly with its structure. Now, we may not consider this a database at all, but a kind of archival system. However, a lot of people do just that today. In fact, the most common database today is what is called a document database, which does exactly that. Most of the times you're working in repositories online, or, you know, or in other forms of structured repository systems, you're using a document database, not a relational one. Of course, there have always been many different database schemas that have been used. No one schema has ever been exclusive. And the dominance of relational databases is long over. Today, there's a growing diversity of database models to choose from. And most of the services we use do not use a relational database. 
Databases like programming languages, apps, and platforms have become diverse local tools resolving particular sets of needs. We can choose our tools depending on our desires. Thanks. Hopefully I'll make it. Yes. On our desires. But we can also build our own tools. I will play this next one because it's fun. And then I'll skip over quickly. Anyway. What I've been trying to show here is that the primary quality of the digital is noise, dissonance. There is no necessary representational relationship between digital encoding and its indispensable technologies and the performances it was put to. As an expressive medium, we are free to choose what we do with our objects. We are free to pursue our desires. Here we have a series of programmatic transformations by Diana Lang of, di of the digital objects, the letters and words that make up Theodore Fontaine's poem, Brook am Tay. The words and letters are released from their confines as narrative text to form complex and revealing patterns that transcend the poem. Nothing is sacred here for Lang because nothing is sacred in the digital. No word, no letter, no poetic illusion. All that was before was disassembled to create whole new forms that are incommensurable with the poem qua poem, but that open up new revelations. Well, we had to get around to the digital museum at some point. Here is a search on the BM Collections catalog. It's a search that my friend Daryl Rigney and I did trying to find the collections that we know the BM holds of his culture, the Naranjiri of South Australia. The catalog does not hold his culture's name, but they do hold a club that is Naranjiri. We know this because it's from the Korong lands of the Naranjiri. We find ourselves as museums in this bind. When we try to commensurate our catalog renderings, renderings with the rich cultural knowledge of other communities. When we try to rectify the dissonance that is always there. Projects such as RRN, Kim Kristen uh, Whitney's uh, Mukurtu, CMS, even my own collaborative catalogs have all sought to commensurate such noise by simply applying digitality as though it would purify the dissonance simply by its application. And I am finishing. Here at the end, I return to Brian Cantwell Smith, this time to his nix to the last paragraph of his entry from the noise catalog. His point is apt here. Noise is not something that is particular to the analog, something that the digital can redeem. Noise exists beyond mediation. It is a quality of knowledge. However, I want to push Cantwell Smith's point to suggest that it is not just that digitality is noisy and messy because it is a media, but because it is the premier noisy media. It has the capability, by virtue of its superior messiness, to transcend perfection and purity. With digitality, we can release our expressive desires as long as we are willing to let go of our desire for commensurability. Thank you.